Hi viewers, welcome to Frank Banket Podcast, a knowledge sharing platform for banking, finance and related technology. Today, we have a very hot topic that is blockchain. So Amit, I hear so much about blockchain and then I was just doing some reading. So I could read uh, about this distributed ledger technology as well. So they both are same or are we are referring to the same coin with two sides? We are actually referring to the same side of the same coin. Oh, okay. When you say distributed ledger technology, we are primarily saying that the information of a particular transaction or particular interaction is being kept in a distributed way with all the participants. So everybody has that trail, everybody has that copy. That is what distributed ledger means. Now to this distributed ledger, you add a few more aspects. For example, you add how you are going to store this information in each of these each of these participants' uh, nodes. Okay in the form of let's say blocks and blocks have a certain capacity so therefore if you want to store more and more information you link the blocks through let's say cryptographic hashes and what you have is a blockchain so in nutshell all blockchain fall under the category of distributed ledger technology but all dlts are not blockchain that's that's in essence the the difference between the dlt and the blockchain sounds good sounds good okay let us go a little more deeper okay about this blockchain yeah, is going to be a revolutionary or it is going to it is the blockchain is going to be a solution for the world's problem is it so when you talk about blockchain uh, there are broadly two kinds of blockchain we refer to one is a public blockchain public blockchain simply mean it's a platform where anybody can join in right it's open to public and then you have private blockchain which is for a specific purpose with limited number of participants Right? It could be an intra-organizational, it could be inter-organizational, but it is for a limited specific purpose. Right, So that is your private blockchain. Now in these blockchains, you would sometimes open it up for participants to join without permission or with permission. So you have permissioned blockchain and you have permissionless blockchain. So for example, your Bitcoin is a permissionless public blockchain where you can, you can join in. Similarly, R3 Coda, for example, is a permissioned blockchain. So these are the broad categories of uh, you know blockchain. Now your question about whether it is revolutionary or whether it will solve world's problems. So I'm I'm sure uh, you know sanity would prevail and people would realize that blockchain cannot solve the larger problems of the world like hunger, poverty, or climate change. But as a package, blockchain is a very powerful and revolutionary concept. Okay. Now. What is there in this package that is making it uh, it's so revolutionary? Four things primarily. First thing is decentralization. Because information is being distributed all across, everybody has the copy. Therefore, you get us you 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 are not worried about this information getting lost from a single registry. Right? So that's one part of it. And we can talk about it a little bit more in detail later on. The second part is what we call as a provenance okay. or uh, you know, a source of truth or a certificate of authenticity. What we are saying is that once the information is captured in blockchain, you will not have to worry about it change, it being tampered with or it changing. Right? So what, what we can say is that the data in the blockchain is immutable. Right? So that's the second aspect of it. And it's, it has its own very relevant uh, uh, use cases, so to say. Third point is programmability. That means when you are doing transactions, on blockchain, you can actually create programs which auto execute. That means the way you do transactions today, which is on pen paper with a wetting, right? You can actually create programs around it, what we call a smart contract. That's okay. a third powerful aspect of it. And the fourth aspect is tokenization. Okay. And when I say tokenization, I'm saying your ability to take an asset and divide it into multiple parts. Okay. All right? And there is no limit to how many parts you can create of, uh, of, of an asset. So these four put together. Bala. Okay. So these are, by standalone basis, these concepts have been there. Okay. But when you put them together in a okay. blockchain, it becomes a very, 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 very powerful uh, you know, tool for solving many, many, many of the problems. Sounds good. Uh, Amit, let's go a little more deeper. Uh, you mentioned about decentralization. Does it mean that we'll not need any regulators? No, if you're living in a perfect world, then you don't need regulators. Okay. You know, human being to human being, there will be good trust. But what happens is when you start a process, right, it starts with good faith, 
but over a period of time vested interests uh, come into it greed comes in and therefore to maintain sanity of any any large scale system you do need regulators you need some rules okay so that is uh, that is one part of it but when you say decentralization and you want to leverage the decentralized aspect of blockchain what i am talking about is your ability to create databases which are distributed across that means you don't have a single source of truth which is at risk of hacking which is at risk of you know ransomware which is on risk of crashing right so that that risk taken gets taken care of that's one advantage the second advantage is because it is distributed and everybody has a clear sight of what is happening you can therefore decentralize decisioning also so in some cases this decisioning can be very very helpful so for example from a banking aspect of it trade finance presents a very good case over here now if you're doing any kind of a trade finance and it is cross border you have many, many participants you have at least two banks sometimes more okay you have the port authorities customs authorities you have the logistics and the shipping you have freight forwarders you have insurance companies and of course you have the buyer and the seller in the in the transaction now with so many participants over here you can leverage how the movement is happening instead of waiting for the physical flow of documentation right and everybody waiting for some confirmations to come from the other sources so platforms like coda ripple are helping you know uh, build build stories around these this kind of use cases interesting uh, amit uh, what about this immutability and trustless aspect so here we are talking about the sanctity of agreements bala you need a whole legal setup contract act stamp papers and what not to ensure that the obligations of each party whenever they are getting into an arrangement are under a some kind of a framework right otherwise verbal commitments people can go back even on written commitments people can go back and therefore you need the entire uh, legal setup around it now with blockchain what happens is you not only have a trail of engagement but more importantly it cannot be edited it is immutable and therefore the question of whether i trust you or not does not arise and that is why we say blockchain it is a trustless uh, you know uh, framework okay amit uh, programmability is also a very interesting aspect to abs yes you can program these contracts with what we call as smart contracts what you are ensuring is that the commitments cannot be rescinded and most importantly it auto executes so your worry about whether the other party the counterparty will comply or you know you will have a breach of trust that risk gets mitigated but there are bigger user cases bala and possibly you know one of the important uh, you know aspect is around the identity management on the blockchain okay so amit you mentioned identity management right mm. that's mean what it is an aadhar or a social security number yes yeah, so that's one part of it your aadhar social security number that's one part of identity management so these identity management for example your whatever be your national id right that is at primarily a database access it might have biometrics uh, you know data appended to it but it is primarily data access so if you go somewhere uh, you flash out your identity card to gain gain access you might be using some digital channels to access that uh, you know authenticating the digital channels to access that so that's one aspect of it but what happens is more and more you use it you do not have a trail of how that information is being used by by the entity to whom with whom you have shared this up there's no trail blockchain can provide you that okay so it can create a new way in which this identities can be managed uh, managed ma- managed much much better with a clear trail of where it was used and therefore the chances of it being exploited for any other purposes falsification etc get get reduced the frauds can be uh, reduced so that's one important aspect which blockchain can possibly provide to us uh, i mean uh, you said there is another part of identity management yeah so as i said identity management that one part is the this the identification that you have in your day to day life another aspect of identification is uh, uh, is in on the web okay so on the web how are you identified you are identified let's say you're logging in you are identified by your email account you might have a google id you might have a facebook id or whatever id correct and that becomes your identifier identifier now who are these entities who are giving you this identity they are private technology companies so therefore you are relying on their good intentions 
to ensure that the, your data security. For example, if I use my my specific mail ID to accessing a website, right? Uh, I do not know how either the mail ID or the or the access provider is using the data which is getting getting access through it. So therefore, is there a better way to ensure that the control of the identity is with you? I do not want my my mail ID for that matter or my identifiers for that matter or which website I have visited for that matter to be in any other database except for where I want it to be. Okay. I don't want, for example, Google to know what I'm purchasing from Amazon. Definitely. I don't want Amazon to know what mail ID I have unless and until I want it to be there. Okay. But the process is such that it has it, it has become very common and we take it for take it for granted. Right. So how do I get control back wherein I know my identity, I create my identity, and I use it wherever I want to use it, right? Okay. So, for example, in the in the uh, data protection bill, we are talking about data fiduciaries and their responsibilities. So, while it's it's done in good faith and you can you know back it up with legis legislation, the the risk still remains because these are commercial organizations and they will leverage uh, data. So, can there be an alternate way in which my identity can be more robust? Interesting, uh, Amit. Seems to seems there will be many who are already waiting for this to happen, and just remain anonymous. Uh, so I'm not talking about anonymity here, Bala. Anonymity, maybe if libertarians may may want anonymity, but what I'm tra trying to uh, say is that I should have control of my identity, right? If I give a copy of my passport somewhere, it should be only for that particular purpose. Right. And on blockchain, if you create a digital passport, which is on blockchain, the access will be only with the, let's say, immigration authorities or maybe with the airlines. And I have a control of where the trail is, who is using and when it is being used based on my permissions, based on the 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 uh, the keys which I allow to be you know, uh, used for accessing my my ID. So that is that is what I'm I'm talking about. It's not about becoming anonymous and because it brings its own risks. If identity in transactions are anonymous, it brings in on uh, AML risks and so on and so forth, right? Okay, let us move to uh, tokenization then. Are we getting into the subject of fractional ownership of real estate? Yes, that's one part of it. So real estate, because fractional ownership is still outside blockchain, also a, a reality. Uh, but beyond that, what blockchain gives you is an ability to tokenize any asset class, okay. whether tangible asset class or an intangible asset class. So, for example, if many people want to own Mona Lisa and none of them can afford it, but if the owner of Mona Lisa wants to share it out, they can create fractions, fractional ownership of Mona Lisa or any okay. digital art for that matter or any building for that matter. And there is no limit of how much fractions you can take. So, for example, if there is a company and you want to create ownership distributed ownership you create shares in blockchain you go multi level below that you can create fractional shares to you know eighth places of decimals or tenth place of decimal and so on and so forth so it democratizes many asset classes your ability to monetize your asset a machinery for example a piece of art for example uh, an anime that you might have created, right? So all kind of asset classes, and we have seen it, right? Of course, we it went a little overboard with uh, NFTs, but music is another another uh, case. So any kind of asset, tangible or intangible, you can tokenize it, you can distribute it, you can create a democratized ownership of it. Okay, sounds good, Amit. So Amit, very nicely we have covered the complete blockchain, but if we are not going to discuss about discuss about one piece then this entire conversation is going to be incomplete. I think you would have, by this time, you would have assumed uh, crypto. Cryptos, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course, cryptos. When you talk about cryptos, um, in my view, there are two sides of it, right? One side of cryptos is about, uh, uh, you know, crypto's impact on the whole monetary policy paradigm, right? And therefore, you can see response of the regulators and uh, how they are treating it as, as, as some bit of, you know, uh, uh, a threat to the existing ecosystem as the existing frameworks. So that's one aspect of cryptos. The second aspect of cryptos is also a crypto's ability to disintermediate banking system, right? And I think th that's where there is some some merit in uh, you know uh, bringing it to the fore. And that uh, you know that brings us to some of the 
more specific use cases for example stable coins is is a is a good case which should be experimented a little bit more possibly uh and another use case is around the the cbdc's the central bank digital currencies yes that's important too yes that's important too especially for bankers do the current cbdc's make sense uh, it's experimental at best at this stage see from a consumer point of view it is difficult to discern how it is different from any other payment uh, you know payment uh, framework so when for example digital rupee came in the initial pitch was that there is anonymity around it once you have put the digital rupee in your wallet banks would not know what you are doing with it but your central bank would know so it is only centralization of information moving from the intermediary to the uh, to the to the regulator so anonymity is not the aspect that i am talking about but cbdc's uh, by themselves have some good use cases as well so for example the cross border the trade finance aspect uh, the payment aspect of it can be good use cases of cbdc's also payment of oblig obligation you are able to program the obligations and that brings in uh, you know the real strength of where cbdc's can possibly evolve hey, amit uh, you talked about uh, permissioned chains like coda ripple and other hand we have cbdc's there are multiple standards platform hence we need interoperability so you are right interoperability is a major major issue and that is why it is taking time for blockchain to become real real mainstream all the significant shareholders are trying to experiment there in their own way but i think over a period of time as the conviction around the technology you know comes in this should get addressed this issue of interoperability should get uh, addressed so possibly in the future you will have the cbdc ex exchanges coming in you might have a, a cbdc credit card uh, there in india for example npci is possibly working on a blockchain framework for payments right and there are other other aspects which are coming in to ensure that this gets uh, more streamlined the interoperability part of it Uh, Amit, uh, lastly, to summarize, uh, what use cases have high plausibility, and where do you see this fiction or fizzle? See, from a medium-term point of view, the best use case in banking seems to be, of course, trade finance, cross-border trade payments. We talked about it. Then security creation, asset monetization, then auto obligation settlements, then of course KYC and compliance. compliance right so in short what we are talking about is both the assets products as well as the liability products banks can uh, leverage blockchain to solve lot of process issues on the fiction side of it see use of blockchain for internal workflow systems like los i think is an overkill you don't need it similarly the ico boom which was there earlier i think we are past that the last point possibly remains as a fiction is the libertarian view that there is no regulator no banks and full anonymity um, that that remains to be remains to be a figment of you know fiction so to say thanks amit for all the insights viewers i am sure you would have got the wonderful insights on blockchain please like comment and share and write to us thank you thank you once again